Now we're going to get into neural learning. So we've formulated um, the, the problem of learning, the optimization problem of neural learning. Now let's look at an actual solution to it. So today we're going to learn about gradient descent learning. The goal is to see how we can use a simple optimization method to tune our network weights. So for this lecture and, and the rest of the course, I'm going to assume that you are familiar with partial derivatives and gradient vectors. If you're not sure what those are, uh, Google it and, uh, and look at a quick tutorial on partial derivatives and gradient vectors, because they are critical to this. Okay, recall that um, the operation of our network can be written as a function at y equals f of x given theta. Now that theta, our, our connection weights and biases. Connection weights and biases. So if our loss function is L of yt, where t is the target, then neural learning becomes the optimization problem of minimizing, with respect to all of our weights and biases, this error function or cost function. Now, I'm just writing it as a function of theta. Of course, um, it'll depend on the data set as well. Uh, but for the purposes of this lecture, I'm just going to ignore all those things and really just talk about how it's a function of our connection weights and biases, which it surely is. And recall that um, E of theta is um, the expected value of our loss, loss of f of x, uh, whoops, x theta. Um, and our target, which also is a function of the input, and that's over all of our data points. Okay, so the expected loss. So we can apply gradient descent to E using the gradient. So the gradient, just as a reminder, it's often written like this. Gradient with respect to theta of E is a vector, di E, by di theta zero. So I'm whatever the first uh, weight or bias or whatever is, I'm just sort of putting them all in order of some order, it doesn't really matter. Di e by di theta one, and so on to di e by di theta um, p, where we have p parameters and transpose, because often we represent, by default and typically in math, we represent vectors as columns, although as, um, You'll see I'm often going to use row vectors, but for now, column vector. So it's basically listing the derivative, the partial derivative of your cost function with respect to each of your parameters, each of the weights, each. You might have hundreds or thousands or even millions of weights and biases. Fine, that gradient vector is hundreds or thousands or millions of elements long. That doesn't matter. Okay, gradient-based optimization. If you want to find a local maximum of a function, you can simply start somewhere and keep walking uphill. For example, suppose you have a function with two inputs. E is a function of A and B. You can think of just A and B, two different weights, a really small neural network, but whatever. But it's a function of two input values and two parameters. You wish to find the A and B values that maximize E. I know we talked about minimizing, uh, but bear with me for now. We're going to maximize. Okay, so <clears throat> we're trying to find the parameters a bar and b bar that yield the maximum value of e. In other words, we're trying to find a bar b bar equals arg max of e a b. So arg max is like the max function, except arg max doesn't it doesn't in terms of return value it doesn't return the value the maximum value of your objective function, it returns the parameters that yielded that value, argmax. Okay, so no matter where you are, uphill is in the direction of the local gradient vector. So, for example, I'll draw the picture in a second. Uh, maybe I'll draw the picture now. So suppose we are here in our parameter space. Now I look, um, that corresponds to some location here, I guess. 
I hope you can see that. Maybe I can do it in white. It corresponds to that location. Now you can see uphill would be kind of going up in this direction here. Whoops, that's a really big fat marker. Let me maybe make it thinner. Up in that direction. So the way to find that direction, um, I mean, that's kind of a 3D vector I just drew. The gradient vector is a two-dimensional vector, which says in this domain of, of A and B, I need to find out uh, what direction I should head in. And, and when I walk on the surface, that'll obviously take me in the y, the z direction as well. So the gradient is in this direction. And that is the gradient of E. So no matter where you are, uphill is in the direction of the gradient vector. So the gradient of E is di E by di A in this case, <clears throat> di E by di B transpose. So if I take a step in that direction, you'll see I might end up over, let me do this in black, I might end up over here. And then my new gradient points me in this direction, in this direction, and you can see if I keep following, going uphill, 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 I will take this path to the peak of the hill. So this is just an iterative method where I, well, no matter where you are, you look at your local gradient by using the, the by computing the gradient vector from the partial derivatives, and you take a step in that direction. So gradient ascent is an optimization method where you step in the direction of your gradient vector. So if your current position is a n b n then your next one a n plus one b n plus one will be your old position a n b n plus some step multiplier times your gradient vector uh, your gradient vector eva oh, come on eraser evaluated at your current location Okay, where k is your step multiplier. So what k you choose can have a profound impact on how well it works, and we'll talk about that. That's uh, a big question in uh, neural networks. So gradient descent, that was gradient ascent. Gradient descent aims to minimize your objective function, so you walk downhill. All you do is step in the opposite direction of your gradient. Okay, so gradient descent, you compute your gradient, take a step in the opposite direction. Note that there's no guarantee that you'll actually find the global optimum, maximum or minimum. In general, you find a local optimum that may or may not be the global optimum. So on the right here, I'm showing two different, uh, sorry, a, a function that has two different um, minima. So depending on where you start, you might end up in this basin or you might end up in this basin. So you, there are two different, I can't show you the other solution that's behind here. But you can see that there are two different basins. Now, the way it's drawn there, they're actually kind of equally good. But you can imagine one basin is higher than the other. If you do gradient descent and land in this higher basin, you are in a local minimum, but um, if you'd started somewhere else, you might have ended up in this lower basin. That might have been better. So even though this is a nice simple optimization method, it has its issues. Luckily, in for neural networks, for the application of neural networks, the objective functions typically have lots of local optima. And <clears throat> as it turns out, often many of them are equally good. And there's there are tricks you can do to try to get to lower ones, and we'll talk about those later. Joke break. Here's a joke. Why is it that you never see elephants hiding in trees? It's because they're really good at it. <laughs> okay. Approximating the gradient numerically. So let's actually apply this. Um, so we can estimate the partial derivatives in the gradient using finite differencing. By the way, this is not the way we're going to do it in the end, but it's just a demonstration. 
The, so the finite difference approximation of the gradient, it comes from, uh, it's derived from the derivatives or the, the definition of a derivative. Remember the definition of a derivative is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of this like the slope of the secant line, whatever. So the finite difference approximation is basically an approximation of the derivative where epsilon doesn't quite go to zero. So for a function e of theta, we can approximate dE by d theta, and I could just as easily have said di e by di theta, doesn't matter, as this. E of theta plus delta theta for some uh, perturbation delta theta minus E of theta minus delta theta, all divided by two times delta theta. So let me draw that in a picture. So here's my theta axis, and um, my theta value is right here. I'm going, uh, let me draw a function as well. Um, here's my function, E of theta. Now, if I go backwards, um, a delta theta, I'm here. So this is theta minus delta theta. And I can go delta theta in the positive direction. So this is theta plus delta theta. If I evaluate my function at these two places, you can see I get those two points. Now, if I were to take the slope of that of those two points, let me let me join them with a line. Um, right, this is where I should use ink to shape. Apparently, it doesn't like to do that. Okay. I'll use a line. Can I? There, yes. Okay. So there's the line that's drawing those two. This value over here is E of theta minus delta theta. And this is E of theta plus delta theta. And the slope here is basically rise over run. So this rise part, this this run part is two times, oh, now it's, uh, it's trying to help me, but it's not really helpful. Erase, turn that off. This is two times the delta theta step that I took. And this rise thing here is what's in the numerator of that fraction. Okay, so now you can see as delta theta goes to zero, those that the slope of that secant line is going to get closer and closer to the actual instantaneous derivative of the function. So this is called the central differencing finite difference approximation of the derivative. <clears throat> so as an example, consider this network. Here I've uh, laid down a, a, a very simple network and a bunch of uh, random connection weights and biases. I'm going to use uh, for this demonstration the, in the numbers written in here, are assuming a logistic activation function. And these here on the are the inputs. This over here is the output. And you can imagine I have a target here. I've written it, written it as a one. Now let's focus on this weight here. Now I'm going to call that theta one. Do I start with zero or one? Theta zero, I guess. Doesn't really matter. Theta zero. So this neural network with the shown connection weights and biases, I can uh, evaluate and I can look at how the error changes as a function of changing theta one. So remember we're seeking to minimize with respect to theta the our objective function. So we will use cross entropy for this example. Okay, so consider uh, okay, I called it theta one. Let's use theta one. 
Consider theta 1 on its own. The initial value is <clears throat> negative 0.509. Okay, so if we um, look at the network output, y equals 0 0.301, which gives um, an error when I put in negative 0 0.509. I get an error of 1.201. So we're not actually um, going to use that, but I'll just outline it. What if we perturb theta 1 by increasing it by 0.1? So instead of being negative 0.509, it's now negative 0.409. In that case, um, this thing here is the delta theta. It's 0.1. The y I get is 0 0.302. Not exactly. I've round. I've gotten rid of a bunch of. I've just rounded off, which gives the error at negative point four zero nine to be one point one nine eight. So I'll use that later. Okay, let's perturb it in the other direction. See, see, this is a positive. Um, sorry, a negative shift now. So this is negative delta theta, and I get a negative point six zero nine. At that case, in that case, y equals zero point three zero two. And my error is at a theta value of negative 0 0.609 is 1.204. So let me summarize those calculations. At theta, at our original theta one value, I had a, a cross entropy of 1.201. When I added 0.1 to my weight, I had 1.198. And when I subtracted, Point one, I had 1.204. Okay, so using those, I can use my finite difference approximation would be um, E of uh, negative 0 0.409 minus E of negative 0 0.609 over 2 times 0 0.1 or obviously 0 0.2. If I add that all together, it's negative 0 0.0292 rounded. <clears throat> that tells me that as I increase theta 1, I will get a decrease in my error. So obviously, increasing theta 1 seems to be the right thing to do. In fact, we kind of knew early on, we could see that by increasing, oops, I just erased a bunch of things. By increasing theta one, I actually got a lower error. But um, by actually computing the partial derivative fully, it gives me some idea of how much I should change or how much the error changes. And it'll be important when we calculate the gradient, which is the partial derivative with respect to all the weights, because some will have big derivatives, some will have small derivatives, and we'll change them all proportionately. Okay, so at this point, then what I would do after doing this calculation, I'd say, well, replace my old theta one with a new theta one. The new theta one is the old theta one minus k times my derivative, 0 0.0292, which equals theta one plus uh, 0 0.292 times k, where k is some positive, um, constant, this constant step multiplier. So in a nutshell, that is gradient descent optimization applied to a single weight of our neural network. Now I could, if I had more time and uh, I didn't like myself who was glutton for punishment, I could go through and do the same exercise for all of the weights, all of these weights and biases, computing the derivative of the error with respect to each weight and bias, that would give me a whole gradient vector. Then I could update all the weights at the same time, take a step updating all the weights, and then I do, uh, I get a new set of weights, then I do the whole process over again, and then over again, and over again. And um, that's how gradient descent optimization works. And next lecture, I'll show you how we have a way of compute. Instead of using this finite difference approximation of the derivative, we can use actual calculus and formulas to do it much more efficiently.